Hello chemists, this is Ms. Placino and you are watching Screencast 7.3 on solids. Today we're going to talk about the different types of solids and some of their general properties. Um, so when we're talking about general properties, what I want you to think about is organization, melting point, and conductivity. Specifically, electrical conductivity or the ability to conduct electricity, one and the same. Uh, so hopefully by the end of today's lesson, you'll be able to look at the names or formulas of different compounds. and You'll be able to classify them as one of the four uh, crystalline solids or as an amorphous solid, as well as know something about their properties. So let's get started. Uh, so I just mentioned these terms, crystalline and amorphous. Here are two examples. Um, hopefully one of the first things you notice as you look at these pictures is that there are two very different degrees of organization. In our crystalline solid, we have a very highly organized structure. Um, crystalline solids are always very organized, and they tend to have repeating geometric patterns. As a result of this organization, uh, we have a definite melting point. Uh, what that means is that this substance is going to melt at a single temperature. For example, we know that ice melts at zero degrees Celsius. It doesn't melt over a range of temperatures. It's going to hit zero degrees, and if it's pure water that has been frozen into ice, then the whole thing's going to melt at zero, and it's going to stay uh, at a constant temperature. The amorphous sample has virtually no organization. It looks pretty random. You might have noticed that both quartz and glass have the same empirical formula, SiO2, uh, but we have two very, very different properties in different substances, I should say sets of properties. So our amorphous has no organization and as a result is going to melt over a range of temperatures. Um, so you don't, might not have uh, used quartz before, but I'm sure you've worked with glass before. We did it in lab earlier this semester. And um, as the glass melts, it doesn't all happen at once. It kind of starts to get soft and pliable in some spaces and not in others. That's what we mean when I say it has a range of melting points. So maybe there's a five, maybe as high as 10 degree range of temperatures where you have melting occur. Uh, so for this lesson, we're going to be focusing in on crystalline solids. Uh, there are four major types of crystalline solids, so let's get into them now. Uh, the first type are what we call network covalent solids. And in the picture, we've got graphite and diamond. Both graphite and diamond are pure forms of carbon. And in this case, carbon is bonded to other carbon atoms in a very large network um, and because carbon is bonded to itself, we've got two nonmetals essentially bonding together, two nonmetallic atoms, we're going to have covalent bonds. And really, these structures are just going to be big, huge, repeating, um, highly organized carbon atoms bonded together. Uh, you should really know graphite and diamond. We mentioned they're highly organized. As a result, they tend to have a very high melting point. Uh, and you probably haven't tried it at home, and I don't recommend that you do, but it's going to be all but impossible for you to melt graphite or diamond with the tools you have at home. As far as electrical conductivity is concerned, usually our network covalent solids do not conduct electricity. Graphite is a major exception to this. If you've ever wondered why your teachers make you fill out those Scantron forms with pencil, it's because graphite conducts electricity. So we can pass your answer sheet through a machine, and we can pass an electrical current kind of through that sheet, and the machine will know where you put your answers. That's also why you should erase really carefully and completely, uh, because the machine will make mistakes if there are any graphite marks left behind. Up next, metallic solids. Uh, metallic solids, um, I described them in class as being kind of communists. Um, we know if it is a communist regime and we're in class and we want to split up our money, everybody pools their money together and then we split it up equally among everybody else. Hopefully it goes without saying that atoms don't have any money. What they, are, uh, what they do have to share though are electrons. So I think there's a picture in your workbook where you have all these positive metallic cations kind of clumped together, and then you have these little electrons kind of moving across them or around them, however you'd like to think of it. Metallic solids 
they will share all of, their, all of their valence electrons with the other metallic atoms that they're close to. Uh, they'll share them all evenly. So you can kind of think of a metal as being like um, a core of cations at the center, kind of, and then you've got electrons that are free to move around them. This leads to a very high degree of electrical conductivity in the solid state. Uh, you probably haven't taken physics yet, uh, but electricity is the movement of electrons. Metallic solids already have these mobile, free-moving electrons, so this is going to lend itself very nicely to electrical conductivity. Uh, metals also have very high melting points for the most part. Um, you can find some exceptions, uh, but across the boards when we think about metallic substances, we're looking at very, very high melting points. All right, so moving right along to molecular solids. Uh, here's our example of ice. Uh, we have water molecules, and they are independent of one another. We talked about it earlier this semester. Uh, they are covalent, uh, sorry, they have intermolecular forces that exist between the molecules. So that's what we're trying to represent here with these dotted lines. I don't know how well you can see them. Uh, more specifically, if we're talking about water molecules, we have hydrogen bonding, a very strong attractive force between neighboring water molecules. Molecular solids are individually covalently bonded. We know the hydrogen and the oxygens are going to share a pair of electrons. And then our neighboring water molecules, as we just discussed, are going to be attracted to each other and held together by intermolecular forces, more specifically hydrogen bonding. Molecular solids, even if they're held together by a strong IMF like hydrogen bonding, have relatively low melting points. Um, you're going to be able to melt them at home. For example, sugar. You can melt sugar. It is covalently bonded within the uh, molecule itself, the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms, but neighboring sugar molecules are just attracted to each other through intermolecular forces. Uh, molecular solids do not conduct electricity. And the question came up in class, well, if that's the case, why do I see all these warning signs on things like toasters and hair dryers telling me not to use them while I'm in the shower? Um, your tap water is not pure H2O. Tap water consists of um, other ions that have been added. For example, many, many years ago, fluoride ions were added to the drinking water to help protect your teeth. Um, and as a result of adding these extra ions, some intentional, some just naturally there, um, tap water will conduct electricity. If you're taking a bath in distilled water, in theory, because there are no ions, you should not get electrocuted, but I highly recommend not trying that at home. Um, we'll discuss why, if it's not you know, already obvious uh, from a common, uh, common sense perspective why you wouldn't want to do that, uh, but truth be told, water actually does ionize a little, and we're going to talk about that much, much later into the spring semester. Last but not least, we have ionic solids. Ionic solids, I know we've seen this picture a bunch of times before. Uh, we have this large repeating network of cations and anions. We call this a crystal lattice. So ionic compounds are extremely well organized. And we have, in this case with sodium chloride, alternating chloride and sodium ions. And this is really uh, just the most stable way to arrange these ions to minimize the repulsive forces between like charges. Ionic solids have really high melting points. Again, this is one that you're not going to be able to melt at home. As a solid, ionics do not conduct electricity. If you're trying to conduct electricity with a block of salt, it's not going to work. However, if you heat up that uh, salt block until it becomes a liquid, um, sometimes the term you'll hear is molten, Or if you take that salt and you dissolve it in water and form an aqueous solution, you'll end up with um, a solution or a liquid, uh, depending upon what you chose to do to your sample, that is capable of conducting electricity. And you might be wondering why that is, because doing something like um, heating it up or even dissolving it are examples of physical changes. How does it change the electrical conductivity? And I'm glad you asked. I've got a video, I'm pretty sure I've shown you this before, but in case I haven't, we'll play it again. In this case, we have sodium chloride and it is in water. So initially it's going to start off as that crystal lattice, but the water molecules are going to act upon it and start to rip it apart. Uh, we know that water molecules are polar, so they've got a positive and a negative end. So they're gonna behave like little magnets and they're gonna be able to break the attractive force between the sodium ion and the chloride ion. And then these ions are going to be free to float around in solution. 
Uh, again, we just have this picture showing how the water molecules would um, kind of arrange themselves around each of the ions. Of course, we have a negatively charged ion. The positive side of the water molecule is going to be attracted to it, and vice versa for a positive ion. But in either case, whether you're talking about um, molten, so we have NaCl as a liquid, or NaCl aqueous, you're going to see electrical conductivity. And that's because you have um, electrons, I shouldn't say that, you have uh, free moving ions. Basically, where you have mobile ions, you're going to have the potential to conduct electricity. Here's another picture of, for another way to visualize, water molecules and sodium chloride. So once it's dissolved in water, you can kind of see uh, they look like they're a little bit washed out. Our water molecules in the background, and then as bright green are our chloride, and silver are our metal, uh, our sodium ions, and they're just free to float around in solution. So these are negatively charged, and these are positively charged, and they're just going to be floating around. Um, when you take something like a salt, any ionic solid really, and you dissolve it in water, you're going to form what's called an electrolytic solution. And an electrolytic solution just means that you have a solution that is capable of conducting electricity. Um, again, I know I've said it a couple times now, it's all because you have ions that are mobile. Uh, this can happen in the molten phase, which is kind of difficult for us to do. We don't always have the equipment needed to reach the melting point of ionic solids, as they tend to be relatively high. Or you can simply take that solid, assuming it's soluble, dissolve it in water, and get your free-moving ions that way. Um, Let's see, electrolytes, um, you've probably heard that term before in relation to things like Powerade or Gatorade. Um, when they say they're replacing your electrolytes, basically what they're doing is selling you a very, very dilute uh, solution of salt water with a lot of sugar added in there so that it tastes halfway decent. Uh, but that's all that's meant by electrolytes. Uh, let's go ahead and try some practice problems. So if you look at the practice problems, you're being asked to classify the following solids as either ionic, network, molecular, metallic, or amorphous. So a whole bunch of choices here. Let's go ahead and get in red. Um, I'm going to look at this first column and maybe a couple of other ones and just kind of walk you through my thought process. So amorphous, they're really just a couple that you need to be aware of. Um, we talked about one at the beginning of the lesson. It's glass. Another that you should be aware of is plastic. Those are really the only two. Um, if we talk about metallic, uh, hopefully it's pretty obvious that you just need to look for a metal. If you have just a metal all by itself, there's a guarantee that you're talking about a metallic solid. Um, network, we've got things like graphite and diamond. There are a couple others, and you'll kind of discover those as you go through these practice problems. Um, ionic is look for an ionic bond. And with a molecular solid, you're really just looking for a covalent bond. So by identifying the type of elements that are present in the formula, uh, hopefully it directs you to really one of these five possibilities. So let's take a look. Letter A is CaCl2, or calcium chloride. I know from, my goodness, many lessons ago that calcium is a metal and that chloride, uh, chlorine is a nonmetal. And I know if I have a metal and a nonmetal bonded together, there must have been a transfer of electrons, therefore an ionic compound. So there is a 100% guarantee that this is an ionic solid. If we take a look at ice, we know that ice is actually H2O. Um, hydrogen is a nonmetal, oxygen is another nonmetal, so they're covalently bonded. Uh, so that could be a network covalent or a molecular solid. Ice is definitely not graphite or diamond, so I think we're pretty safe calling this a molecular solid. Glass. Glass is one of the examples that we talked about at the beginning of the lesson, and glass is always going to be amorphous. For better or for worse, it's just one you kind of have to memorize. Diamond. There's another that you just have to memorize. Uh, this is going to be a network covalent. I'm going to abbreviate that NC. 
NH4Br. This is ammonium bromide. Uh, this is one that people usually get tricked by. It looks like we have all nonmetals with nitrogen, hydrogen, and bromine. Uh, but if you think about this, NH4 is the ammonium ion. Wow, that is terrible handwriting. There we go, ammonium ion, and then we have the bromine ion, Br minus. So even though these are all nonmetals, this is an ionic compound because we have two different ions. So therefore, if there's an ionic bond present, we're talking about an ionic solid. We'll do another one just to make sure we've got it. Uh, tungsten. Tungsten is element W on the periodic table. Uh, tungsten is a transition metal, so you can hopefully figure out that this must be a metallic solid. You uh, just kind of want to go through and identify the solids kind of in the manner that we've been doing. Um, you have to keep kind of in the back of your head graphite, diamond, glass, and plastic. Those are kind of their own separate issues. Um, if you have just a single element name um, or an alloy of two metals, you're talking about a metallic um, solid in most cases. Um, and then you have to look at the type of bonds that are going to exist. If it's an ionic bond, definitely going to be an ionic solid. If you have covalent bonds present, very good chance you're looking at a molecular solid. All right, I would highly recommend trying out these other practice problems just to make sure that you've got the hang of it. Uh, thanks for tuning in, and I hope you found this video helpful.